Thank you. Sorry, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Uh, my name's John Keeper, as you know. Um, I work in cultural policy, the arts, and the creative industries. Um, I've worked for big organizations, small organizations, worked in urban regeneration, uh, and I chair an organization in London called A New Direction, which works with young people, creates opportunities for them in, in culture and, and creates access for them in culture. Um, I've tended to jump backwards and forwards from small organizations to big organizations, but now I think I've settled down and realized I can't work for big organizations anymore. So I'm now settled. Um, what I'm going to start off now, and this is, it's almost a rude thing to do, really. I'm going to start, rather than talking about a library, I'm going to talk about a bookshop. Uh, and there's a reason I'm going to talk about this bookshop. Um, this is a little bookshop I worked in way back. Let's see if I've got another picture of it as well. No, just this one. Um, and it, during the summer of this year, I got it asked by an old friend of mine. And I worked in this bookshop in the 70s and 80s. And it was a very small shop in the backs, of, uh, in a street full of the backs of restaurants in Brighton, which is on the south coast of um, England. Uh, and this shop was tiny. I mean, probably the floor space was less than the size of this stage, I would think. Uh, and while I was there, we, um, I basically read every book in the bookshop. It was, my, it was my equivalent of going both to university and also going to my, my local library. I basically read the whole shop. But crucially about this place was we did a lot of other things in this tiny little space. We sold books. We didn't sell very many books, actually. We sold a few books now and then. Uh, we put on events. We had a basement, which we, we, we did up ourselves. The, the building was originally squatted. It was actually occupied illegally by a group of people who wanted to basically make it into a community kind of space. So there was, we put on events in the basement. There was music performances. There were poetry readings. There was storytelling for children. People used to just leave their children in the bookshop while they went off and did other things they had to do. Um, there were debates in the bookshop. There were uh, exhibitions in the bookshop. Uh, it was a very, very social space. And it was a, a, in a kind of area which wasn't part of a normal shopping area. So people used, used, just used to come into the shop from the local community. I mean, it was really not a, not a, 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 a certainly not something like a proper chain store bookshop. And what was interesting, we gave the talk about this, this bookshop in Brighton. And I fully expected the room to be full of people kind of my age, 60-year-olds, who basically wanted to reminisce about their times visiting this bookshop in Brighton. But what was interesting, the half the audience was young people. And I was quite ple very pleasantly surprised by this. So I asked, at the end of the talk, I asked some of the young people why they'd come. Actually, I was just interested to know why they were there. And they were saying, well, actually, some of the ideas you were talking about, notions of, uh, of being very close to a community, about shared learning, about informal spaces, about mixing up different things in the same space, about learning from each other, about improving each other's ideas. Well, they felt very, very, very relevant to what's happening today. Of course, the big difference to what was happening in the 70s and 80s and what is happening today is the fact that we're in a whole digital environment, which it makes things completely different. So it was interesting, we carried on the conversation after the, after the talk and then went on to actually continue it at another time. And I ended up talking to Google at one point in London about some of the ideas that came out of the, um, came out of the talk. So it was a kind of interesting time. This was later. This is when uh, color was invented in the 1980s. So this is when the bookshop went into color um, and became slightly, we actually put a bookshop in the title of the shop at this time. <coughs> now, for me, it was very important because I didn't go to university. I came from a fairly poor back working class background. I didn't go to university. I didn't actually have a local library where I lived. So for me, at the age of 20 or so, going and working in this space was my equivalent of going to university and discovering a library at the same space. And I think since then, I've always been looking for those kind of qualities in, in a public space, and particularly looking for those kind of qualities in the library. Incredible resource, lots of books, lots of things to learn about. That notion of sharing things with other people, which I think is crucial and also the notion that you can do a lot of things in one place, which is friendly and social and nice. So that's enough of the past. Now I want to kind of jump forward right to the future, or to the present and the future now. Now there's a lot of, um, I don't know how many people here spend a lot of time on YouTube, but one of the interesting things I've been finding on YouTube recently is how 
effectively informal learning is taking place on, on, on platforms like YouTube. One of my very favorites is something called the Vinyl Community, which is basically people standing in their rooms or sitting in their rooms and showing people their records. Now, this sounds extremely dull, but there are thousands of people doing this, showing people their record collections, talking about their records, sharing information with other people. And there are now thousands of people doing this on YouTube, um, debating with each other, exchanging presents with each other, and, and basically interacting with each other. Now, you don't think of this as being learning, but it is learning. It's informal learning. It's people learning about music from each other. It's not people learning from each other music about music from books. It's people learning from each other. And there are examples all over uh, social networking sites and YouTube and so forth of people doing this. You could probably find something in farming, or you could probably find something in uh, needlework to have the same kind of thing. But it's very interesting how big these things are getting. And it's quite interesting talking to some of the people who actually manage these platforms is that they weren't aware that thousands and thousands of people were standing in front of cameras and showing people and talking about the music they liked and so forth. So on one level, you've got informal spaces, you've got um, flexible spaces, you've got spaces where people can learn from each other. And on another level, you've got this whole world that's going on in the digital environment where people are learning from each other. Um, I think one of the things I'm quite interested in for the future is how you can start to bring those things together and how you can start to bring those things together in, a, in, a, in one environment. Because you've got one mode of learning happening here and you've got another mode of learning happening there. Um, we, uh, I'm involved, as you heard from the introduction, I'm involved with a, a, a company called John 3 Sheila. Uh, and the reason we're called that is that three of us are called John and one of us is called Sheila. And we couldn't think of a better name. Um, we published two books. One was called After the Crunch, and one was called Creativity, Money, Love, which is the name of this um, talk as well. And one of the things that came out very strongly is that to, for people in the future, particularly young people in the future, to actually be able to work, and I think all the economies across Europe, we're seeing great problems. I mean, it's not obviously acute problems here in Greece, but also big problems with youth unemployment in the UK and elsewhere is that as well as learning the skills that people need, the knowledge skills, people are going to need to learn to make their own jobs in the future. It won't be enough to take jobs. People will have to make their own jobs and develop their... We heard earlier on about um, business centres within libraries and so forth. But also those skills of actually being able to get in a room with a group of people and be able to um, solve problems together is like a crucial part of making jobs in a lot of industries in the future. The notion that you can sit and learn by yourself, pass your exams, go to an interview with somebody else and get a job is going to get increasingly difficult in the future. So that collective problem solving, that working in teams. And I was wondering whether, in a sense, a library could, libraries of the future could start playing a role here. So not just, in a sense, being in a broadcast mode, not just putting information out to people, but also providing a forum where people can solve problems together. It's a very, in a sense, it's a very old idea. I mean, a lot of societies had somewhere where you could group together as a community, use all of your pooled knowledge, use, use all the knowledge that came before you, but also start to think about solving problems in the future. Um, and I've been um, involved with an advisory group for Tate Modern in the UK, the, um, the, the, new Tate, the newer Tate building in the UK. And there's some in very interesting thinking there about how they can use some of their public spaces in the future not just for exhibitions, not just for education, but for a kind of different engagement with the public and, and bringing all that creativity together to not just, in a sense, learn, but also try and solve some problems. And I think that's the kind of role that hasn't happened with libraries in the past and something that maybe could happen in the future. And it seems to me one of the ways of doing this is by asking questions. One of the things that the internet has proved very effective is, is solving problems. And there's this notion, I don't know if people here know the American writer Clay Shirky, but he writes about this idea of a cognitive surplus. And what he means here is that locked up in everybody are lots of solutions to lots of problems. So the idea that you always just refer to, export, sorry, to experts in terms of being able to solve your problems is, in a sense, something for the past. We should now be looking to pull in information, knowledge, ideas from a much, much wider community. And once again, 
you know, this is happening online, but I wonder whether libraries in the future can be the kind of space where you start pulling in not just all the knowledge that already exists, but the knowledge that's locked up within people as well in the future. So from this little bookshop, in a sense, um, with a tiny little, little room inside it, I mean, in a way, I got the kind of start to think about this. And what's been useful recently is talking to a lot of younger people who are involved with digital culture in different kind of ways. It started to create within me, I guess, an interest in whether phys you could start using physical spaces in a different kind of way. Now, some of that practically will mean, in a sense, loosening up some of the programming of buildings, in a sense, providing sociable, friendly space where people can just be together and actually talk to each other, learn from each other. And lots and lots of public buildings are doing this now. Um, and my last point, I guess, is to say that I mean, nobody's got very much money anymore. I mean, across Europe, funding, whether it's coming from governments, whether it's coming from trusts and foundations, God bless the Nyarkos Foundation for doing all the work you've done here, but it's getting harder and harder to find money to do things. So, in a way, it's got to be about trying to find new kinds of solutions to, to, to problems in the future. And, and wondering whether, in a way, that the, you know, the physical space, the library, can be one of the sources to do that. I think in the future it's not going to be enough for cultural buildings to just be cultural buildings. We need to do more. Everybody needs to have, in a way, another, another life, in the, another social purpose, as well as being a cultural resource and so forth. So that's all I wanted to say, really. And um, thank you for listening. And thank you for inviting me to the conference as well.